Okay, so hello everyone and thanks so much for joining us today um, for our important discussion of queer racism, the people behind the LGBTQ acronym. Um, this event was organized by Fielding's Building Inclusion Collaborative in honor of Pride Month. And we've assembled an all-star group of experts here to dive into the subject matter for you today. Um, I've put their bios in the chat box for you to peruse at your leisure. They're long and these people have a lot of experience, so we thought it'd be better to put them there than to spend time during the panel reading through them. Um, but they're there if you'd like to. Um, I want to remind everyone that we are recording this discussion to share with others afterwards. Eventually, it'll be up on our YouTube channel probably next week. And I'll remind our panelists to please mute yourselves if you have any background noise going on at your location. It doesn't sound like it now. And then, of course, unmute yourselves when you'd like to like speak. So um, without further ado, I'll introduce our esteemed moderator, President Katrina Rogers, whose extensive experience um, as an educator includes teaching in global environmental politics and policy and social movements and leading the European campus for Thunderbird School of Global Management in Geneva, Switzerland for a decade. Uh, working with international organizations such as the Red Cross, World Trade Organization, United Nations Development Program, and the European Union. She's also a proud activist in both social and environmental justice. So, President Rogers, the, the floor is yours. Take it away. Thank you very much, Starshine. And again, welcome, everyone. And Starshine, if my voice changes or my volume shifts, let me know. Will do. Anyway, but it is a pleasure to see you. The panelists here today, and as Starshine has said, uh, it's, it's a terrific uh, combination collective of, of, of experience and expertise that we're happy to share and also to investigate that this is a, a panel of inquiry as much as anything else. And I'm really proud that we're doing this panelist in honor of, of Pride Month, in honor of um, LBGTQ community and, our, and, and Fielding's role in it as well, to be able to sponsor uh, deep dialogue and conversations on topics such as these. So I'd like to introduce the panelists quickly. As Starshine has said, you are free to look at the chat for the lengthier bios, but I still, I think it's um, good to recognize and, and honor their work and their interests uh, over the course of their professional and personal lives. So first I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Jill Porter. Dr. Porter is Fielding's provost. And he has, as, as, um, as you will note in the chat, a long career. Uh, I think most notably for this session, in the late 1990s, he developed one of the first and only graduate courses for mental health clinicians on the needs of transgender and intersex people in their families. And that was really new at the time. He has particular interest in marginalized parts of the LBGTQ community such as the Black and Latino gay and trans youth in the urban house scene and cross-dressers, and the intersection of body modification culture and gendered expression. Uh, so welcome, Jerry. Good to see you today. Great, thank you. Uh, as another panelist, we have Terry Hildebrand, who is, I'm proud to say, a graduate of Fielding, as many of our panelists are. Uh, Terry is currently uh, the director of Fielding's evidence-based coaching program and has a significant reputation nationally in coaching. Uh, he's also the founder of, the, um, of, of his own company, Terry Hildebrand and Associates, and a Gay Coaches Alliance member. And I think he was a keynote speaker at their most recent conference. Uh, his work has really been to be an advocate for workplace equality and spiritual moral equality for LBGTQ people. And Dawson, it's good to meet you. I've, I've certainly seen you uh, on other calls and such, but I don't think we spent much time together. Dawson Woodrum is a PhD candidate at Fielding in clinical psychology. And uh, in his prior life, he worked as a regulatory lawyer and currently a fourth year doctoral student. I think, I think it's an excellent uh, combination of uh, experience and knowledge. Uh, Dawson openly identifies as a trans man, and I think notably here that your own personal experience has led him to a deep understanding of how religious and spiritual traditions can be both a source of strength and a stigma when one identifies as LGBTQI. And the work done personally and professionally has been focused on how to develop a stronger sense of self-agency when making choices about conflicts between sexual orientation, gender identity, religious affiliation, and spirituality. And if you can see there's somewhat of a connection between 
Terry and Dawson in terms of, of your life's work. And then our fourth panelist is Laura McGuire. Laura, welcome. Uh, also a graduate of Fielding in the EDD program and the founder of the National Center for Equity and Agency and is a recognized as a sexuality educator, trauma-informed specialist and inclusion expert. So I would like to welcome you as well, Laura. Thank you. So we have uh, Jerry, Terry, Dawson, and Laura with us today. Jerry is calling in from Central Coast, California. Terry from Denver, Colorado. Dawson from a small town in Georgia. Dawson, I'm sorry, I forgot the name. And Laura from Florida. So I welcome you all today to the panel. And again, I just, for those, for those who may have joined us a little late, please know that the, all the bios have been posted in the chat. So I wanted to just start the conversation. I think that there's uh, much to be discussed here and we have not a lot of time, but I think we can dig deep fast because we are fielding people and we know how to do that. Uh, there are a number of topics that we could really cover today, but the title of the panel is, is a racism, right? Is queer a racism? And what do we mean by that? And I thought that I'd throw it out to Jerry as our most senior person here this morning, but I really would like the panelists to be thinking about what they would like to say about this topic. And then of course, if you have other remarks, please feel free to, to get the ball rolling, so to speak. So Jerry, I would start by asking you, how can we as scholar practitioners address the problems uh, associated with the racism? And what do we even mean by that? You know, why is this notion of a racism important to address? as educators, as psychologists, as coaches, and as organizational system change practitioners. The panelists are all of these things. And I think, I think this is a good jumping off point for a deeper conversation today. So Jerry, I would turn to you and then please um, turn, pass it on to another panelist. Sure, thank you, Katrina. And, uh, and I just wanna say what a pleasure it is to have an opportunity to really talk about these issues with the fielding community. Um, and I think that actually speaks to the issue of racism in that um, there's a lot of discussion uh, and superficial awareness of LGBT issues in the larger world, um, but not necessarily a very deep understanding of those issues and of the life experiences of LGBTQ people. And so I think it's really important for us to do everything we can to um, make a real connection with the, the larger world about um, what, what these issues really mean to people who are living these, these experiences. And so, um, uh, uh, there's a tendency for these kinds of superficial treatments to erase, if you will, the actual lived experience. And so um, that needs to be countered with real factual knowledge. And one of the things that I've seen that's really powerful is when um, people who identify as straight have an opportunity to really hear the life experience of LGBTQ people. Um, and they begin to recognize that their lives are not so different um, and to begin to have insight in the ways in which they might be different and how often the differences are created by the intolerant and problematic attitudes that prevail in the larger society. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jerry. I appreciate that. Dawson, would you like to weigh in on this topic? And you are on mute. Yes. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think as I was reviewing, um, getting ready for Pride and reviewing the history of Stonewall, it really became apparent to me, um, even the racism within the community. Uh, I think a lot of people uh, aren't aware that some of the primary uh, progenitors of the Stonewall riots were people that were gender nonconforming and people that were not white and uh, a lot of intersectionality there. And uh, leaving those, uh, those histories out and excluding uh, even later in uh, LGBT pride marches and so forth 
for a long time, excluding uh, that part of uh, our history, is part of that racism that we've carried forward with us. And so um, I wanted to just kind of bring that forward as, as part of the racism, particularly as experienced by people who are, are gender nonconforming in particular. Um, and I see that quite a bit in my uh, clinical practicum, uh, quite frankly, in terms of the young students that I'm working with that are, are gender nonconforming and feel uncomfortable that, you know, the, the, the rainbow uh, isn't necessarily a safe space for them that, they, that some people assume it is. Thank you, Justin. And thank you for raising early on in the conversation intersectionality, because I think we'd like to dig deeper into that piece. Uh, Laura. Yes, hello, everybody. Um, so, you know, my first thought with this is definitely um, the fact that people both have negative attitudes, but they also don't know a lot of times what they don't know. And most recently, I was working with the government and advocating for both um, sexual assault, sexual harassment prevention, but also within and outside of that LGBTQ inclusion. And right now, there's a lot of racism within the military, particularly of um, trans and gender nonconforming service members. And, you know, where many colleges in the mainstream have already, you know, started taking steps towards improving their policies and making more inclusive spaces, the military is still taking baby steps in that direction. Um, and then I also think, you know, about many different systems where, you know, people's hearts might be in the right place, whether it's schools or medical centers, you know, different communities I've, um, I've worked with where they want to do what's right. Uh, but they don't realize that they're completely forgetting and excluding um, a large number of people in their experiences. And so I think that's a big part of our work is making sure that we're having conversations where we approach people and say, you know, I, I know you want to build a better world, but there are some things you might not have thought of. And, you know, here are some ways that you can improve your policy and practices. Thank you, Laura. Um, I think there's a lot of food for thought there, so we're going to come back to that, certainly. Um, Terry, would you like to weigh in initially here? Sorry, I was still muted. Um, three things come to mind immediately that I think are particularly salient right now. Um, we had been making progress around visibility of LGBTQ people. Until recently, um, the, uh, the, the uh, US Census now will not be including LGBT people in the next round of census. And that is a big change uh, from this current administration. So we are literally being erased mm -hmm. from the data of this country. And uh, secondly, <clears throat> the CDC, the Center for D Disease Control, has issued a, a memo last year that they should not use the word transgender or diversity in any of their communications. So this is systemic <laughs> racism at its most uh, fundamental level. I think at another level, um, we have some fundamental uh, issues around even giving not gender nonconforming people a way to identify in our systems and, and uh, forms. Uh, today, you have to choose male or female in so many places in the world, and there's not a third option. However, we have seen some progress in places like India, which allows for a third indicator on their passports. So we're seeing movement globally, but America is still falling behind in this area. I think thirdly, uh, in the corporate world, I led a big initiative about 10 years ago to, to allow LGBT uh, employees identify, self-identify uh, in employment, uh, to provide some awareness of how many LGBTQ people exist in the organization. Uh, so there's movement there uh, in the corporate arena to, to stand up and be counted, uh, but there's still a lot of, of um, you know, we have a long way to go, and we've also experienced setbacks uh, most recently in the current administration. Okay, great. Well, let's, let's, take, let's pause here and linger and dig a little deeper. I'd also like to just remind the, uh, the participants who are listening in today that you are free to type in questions in the chat function for our panelists as well. So Terry and Laura, I wanna come back to these 
these things. I think they're really interrelated. So Laura, you said that there are organizations in some of the places and spaces where you've worked where you may even see good-hearted people and even organizations that want to do the right thing, but it's really hard to do the right thing or because they don't even, may not even know what that is. Or as Terry has pointed out, there may be significant systemic barriers to that and not only an unknowing, but also a, a, a barrier that makes it very difficult to, uh, to actually help people be seen and heard. And so a question I have for you, Laura, if you would like to investigate a little deeper for us is, what are some of the things that you've seen that has either been concerning or that you've been able to use to overcome? And I think about this in the fielding context. I think fielding may be somewhere along that continuum as well. You know that there, there's, a, there's a long way to go in any organization um, to get to, feel, to build a truly inclusive community. And that, of course, would include LBGTQ. So I'm very curious about what you've experienced as an organizational development. Yeah, so I think some of the big pieces are, um, you know, and this kind of actually feeds into the first question as well, you know, the, the effects, both on a micro, meso, and macro level of, of erasure, of marginalization, um, that, you know, if you told somebody by making assumptions by you know different microaggressions that you're not aware of, you are traumatizing um, you know a huge part of your organization, your school, your community. Uh, you're making it unsafe for them to speak up and to access resources, be successful, all of those things, right? And and so if you sat down and you told people that, they would say, "Oh my goodness, you know, I I would never intend that," right? And it's it's the difference between our intention and our impact. So a lot of people's intention is wonderful and they want the world to be, you know, this positive and, you know, inclusive place, but they just haven't maybe taken the time to self-educate on, you know, the, the, again, the assumptions in particular they're making. And so, you know, even um, like some of the panelists have mentioned, you know, forms. Are they looking at their forms? Are they thinking about people who, you know, can't pick one gender or the other, or that doesn't really explain their experience and their identity? Um, you know, if somebody says that they're married or that they're in a relationship, are they automatically gendering who they think their partner would be? You know, and there, again, just so many different little things. Um, in the schools in particular that I've, I've worked with, there are a lot of um, comments from both educators, faculty, uh, and also staff and administration where people think that they're just making a harmless joke or comment. And, um, you know, I have a lot of privilege as a queer woman. Uh, part of that privilege is I definitely pass as straight in many communities because I'm very feminine presenting and I'm cisgendered. And so people will say really, really horrible things in front of me <laughs> because they think that, you know, this is, this is a space where no one's going to get offended. And so, again, that, that goes back to the education piece. And, you know, that's why I got my doctorate in education, because I believe it's a huge part of the answer, is making space where we have conversations and we say, you may not be aware of this, but this is why this is problematic. And these are how, you know, your comments, your beliefs are both physically and mentally harming the people around you. Mm -hmm. well, I, think it's, I think these are very interesting remarks, especially connected to systemic change. So you've got individual agency, which Dawson, you've, you've referred to as well. And Terry, uh, you know, you brought in the systemic issues as well. And so I think what, what we're really looking at is how do, how do we as educators and scholars and, and people who are committed to positive social change, how do we understand that intersection of that human development piece and that human frame and the systemic piece? And I'm curious, Terry, if you have anything to add to, to this conversation based on some of the remarks you made previously. Well, you know, I, I think that the, the observation that uh, people don't necessarily perceive um, a woman who appears to be, uh, they don't read her as being, uh, um, you know, gender nonconforming. Well, 
I think the thing is, they know. They already know on some level that that's problematic. Otherwise, they wouldn't be engaged in that behavior. And I think the reality is, is that straight people don't need to self-educate. Um, and so uh, education uh, can play an important role in that um, at some point, people need to decide that they need to take responsibility for actually um, changing their, their motivation and their desire um, and their willingness to engage this issue. But, um, uh, but for the most part, the vast majority of people um, may be well-intentioned, maybe not well-intentioned, but um, they don't have any necessity. And so I think education can move people to the point where they're perhaps willing to take responsibility. Yeah, so if I understand what you're saying correctly, is what you're saying is people may need to self-educate, but they don't see any pressure to, you know, they don't necessarily feel any pressure to do so. Yes. Right? Because the society is designed for, for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Terry, would you like to weigh in here? And then Dawson? Yeah, absolutely. Um... So one of the <clears throat> studies that I did as part of my dissertation was looking at how um, uh, evangelical Christians change from anti-gay to pro-gay. And I specifically was interested in this because I wanted to see what does it really take for an individual to change their mind about specifically spiritual and moral uh, equality, which is, you know, still a huge uh, challenge, probably one of the biggest challenges that we face in America today, and maybe globally. <clears throat> and what I found is that it really is a personal journey of uh, your own experiences impacting your personal transformation. Uh, and uh, it wasn't what I expected. Uh, it was really about what was going on in them and then later changing their mind about others. So it's very consistent with um, human development theory uh, that we all learn at fielding, you know, that mm -hmm. it takes a crisis for us to really change sometimes. And that crisis causes us to relook at what we've believed before and reconceptualize what's important to us. Uh, transformative learning and conversion theory really came into play here. And, you know, we often say that it's changing minds and hearts one person at a time. And that in turn changes systems, which in, cha which in turn change organizations. Um, so I think they're all interconnected and we have to really operate at all of those levels all the time, you know, mm -hmm. looking at the person in front of us and understand what's going on for them and have empathy for them and, and where they're at in their own journey. Cause we're all on a journey, no matter who we are, whether we'll, you know, in, in any uh, specific uh, identity that we, or multiple identities we carry, we're all on our own individual journey and so is everybody else. Uh, and being just really sensitive to that. And, and, and uh, I think scholars, particularly fielding people, are really well positioned to understand what those journeys look like and how to facilitate change at the individual level, at the, at the organizational level, and then even at the systemic level. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Terry. I think it's interesting when you were talking about, I've seen the old adage that no one is born a racist or a sexist or anti or homophobic and that these are social constructs that are imbued quite early though in society, right? It's about seeing the society's behaviors around us, right? We also know from research though that it doesn't, that, that you can diminish racism, you can diminish um, anti-gay sentiment by, by, um, by not only by education, but also by experience. So part of it is in a truly inclusive society, we would then, all of us, have more diverse experiences. So that's part of the logic, I think, of inclusion, and, and I'd love for others to weigh in on that. But I think that is part of the logic, that to build inclusion is not to, in fact, the opposite of erasing dis difference. It is to bring it all together, right? All together so that we experience society in, a, in, in the way that it is, robust, rich, complex, diverse. Uh, Dawson, I wanted to bring your voice into the conversation. Curious about what you're thinking. 
So for, for me, some of the thoughts that came to mind on the inclusion side is where I've seen people, you know, change and, and, and make a di difference is when they say, well, I, you know, I used to think this, but now I don't because I know somebody that's, and then they, they put in the identity there and they start talking about their experiences, for example, of knowing somebody that's gender nonconforming and witness just moving through the world and mm -hmm. becoming a more compassionate person as a result of that. Um, and I think on the other hand, what I'm seeing and what I'm worried about now is the wedges that are being driven in between uh, in terms of any sort of inclusiveness, any sort of move towards uh, trying to get people to be aware of privilege and aware of language and that being turned on its head now. And we're seeing, uh, wedges such as uh, under uh, religious freedom laws, as they're called. And we're seeing even academics, respected academics uh, in the field of psychology, for example, Jordan Peterson comes to mind, who are talking about the fact that, you know, their freedoms are being impinged. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's imperative that we stay on top of this and understand the implications and have a clear uh, story to tell about where we stand so that people aren't confused. Mm -hmm. And I think that reductionistic um, outrage around um, not wanting to confront white privilege is a part of that, Dawson. I think I mean, you make a very good point there. And also this notion of uh, talking about identity politics as a negative, right? That, that we just all need to be more homogenous. If we could just get that through society, things would be easier. Well, that's the way it has been. And of course, it's been easier for the privileged few, mostly white, right? mostly white and straight. Uh, there are a couple of, pan of questions coming up now, and I'd love to bring in the voice of our participants. So one person has asked, and I'd love to see what the panelists think about this comment. Have any of you had experiences where other members of the LGBTQ communities, uh, quote unquote, erased you from the situation? I've certainly heard that from members of the trans community. Jerry, it reminds me of some of your early research about those marginalized in the community itself. And I wonder if it occurs also for, oops, I'm sorry, I'm working with my um, chat, for LGBTQ community members. I guess I'm talking about a racism within our own communities. So responses, I'll just throw that out to the panelists who'd like to chime in first. Well, um, I'll, I'll chime in just to, and talk about a specific example that, that I've seen. Um, in the case of the personal journey of female to male transsexuals who often initially find a home in the lesbian community, may have a partner who identifies as lesbian. And then that individual discovers that they think they're trans. Um, and so that sometimes creates a real difficulty for them in the community they've initially found a home in where they're rejected um, as a trans person and, and people think that they're just confused or, um, uh, and so that, that, that is, is sometimes a real problem for uh, especially female to male trans people who, um, uh, are, are, are really identifying as trans. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Carrie. Um, Laura? Yes. Um, so I, I definitely think this is still a huge issue, and I think it's an important um, topic to bring up, especially during Pride Month. Uh, you know, I've definitely been personally in spaces where, uh, again, even by my own community, they're assuming and reading me as um, straight. And they'll, they'll make comments of, you know, <clears throat> oh, well, this is, you know, for people of this experience. And it's, it's so nice that you're this awesome ally and yeah. <laughs> just here to support us, um, you know, but they're, they're not necessarily asking me about, you know, my personal story and experience. Um, and then I think the other part of it too, again, especially during Pride, is bringing awareness to the fact that a large number of Pride events around the country are really aimed for um, gay white men. And there is, of course, you know, nothing wrong with everybody coming together and, you know, having their spaces and, and finding connections, but we wanna make sure that we're broadening what that looks like. Um, 
And again, I think it's unintentional. People aren't necessarily saying, well, this is just for gay white men, but, uh, but it's, you know, it's still very present. Um, and that also includes people who are, um, you know, neurodivergent and also have different physical abilities. A lot of these spaces are not inclusive um, of being accessible. And so you have a huge number of people from different communities who don't feel like Pride events are really for them. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's super problematic and something we can actually pretty, pretty easily solve if we're more aware of it. Thank you, thank you. Um, appreciate that, digging down a little deeper. Uh, Terry, you, I know you wanted to say something and also Dawson, but Terry first. Yeah, I was reading this morning in the local um, Pride Fest guide, uh, how um, bisexuals in particular in Denver were feeling underrepresented and invisible. <clears throat> and uh, I think it's an ongoing challenge because in, on one hand, some can pass, but those who choose to come out, it's always coming out for a bisexual, no matter what environment you're in, whether you're in a you know, cisgendered straight in, environment or a, a, a gay environment. Um, people don't believe you when you're bisexual. My uh, brother-in-law is bisexual and has identified that way. And in, even though he had a, uh, uh, a same, same gender partner for a lot of years, uh, he was still bisexual and, and it created a lot of challenges, I think, for him to always have to correct people who had made assumptions about, are you really, are you gay or no, I'm not, not actually gay, even though I'm in a same gender relationship. I think secondly, <clears throat> there has been some interesting, um, I would say a paradox is how I would describe it, between um, the desire to have safe spaces for individual communities, and then at the same time, um, having inclusive uh, spaces at the same, you know, uh, so an example of this is, you know, uh, a, w a women's uh, festival, you know, are men welcome there or not? And, you know, how do we create a safe space for, that are maybe women only? And men desire that as well. And there are certain clubs that are geared in the gay community for men who who really are attracted to men. And uh, there's, they're often criticized for being exclusive as opposed to really creating a safe space for folks to affiliate. So I think there should be room in our community for both, that there are places where we all come together and we see each other as a big, happy gay family. Uh, and then other places where we can carve out room for individual groups to really uh, be with their tribe and to deal with their unique issues. I, I can, you know, I, I have um, been fortunate enough to be um, part of uh, transgender spaces, but every time I'm there, I'm very aware that I'm a guest. This is not my space, it's their space. And, and I think um, sometimes because gay men, specifically gay white men, are viewed as, you know, dominant and always having a safe space, that they are in some ways denied that space for fear that uh, they're not being inclusive. So I just think that we have a big enough tent here to be able to have safe spaces for everybody, um, but also be inclusive and, and be able to sit with that paradox. Thank you, Terry. Dawson. I don't even know where to begin. <laughs> so a lot of those experiences I could echo. Um, having transitioned female to male, I have a you know a, a, a you know I had that type of binary experience, um, but I did experience the you know the um, the negative impact in my friends, my former lesbian friends, and my circle of lesbian friends because I was lesbian identified. Uh, lost some friends. Um, gained new ones, luckily, uh, but uh, it's, it's uh, I also grew up in Michigan where there was the Michigan Women's Music Festival, and um, that, uh, that particular festival went through some pretty hard times with uh, uh, grappling with the idea of what it meant to be a women's only space and took the position of excluding uh, trans women uh, and having a woman born woman policy uh, towards the end, uh, that festivals uh, mm -hmm. disbanded. Now they no longer uh, have festivals. But I often pondered the idea of um, before I legally transitioned, and my my birth certificate hadn't been changed yet. But I had all medically transitioned. I thought 
it would been it would have been an interesting experience for me to show up with a, a, a trans woman as an activist kind of experience and say, okay, you're going to let me in and not her, <laughs> um, you know. Um, <laughs> we, and I didn't get to do that because the timing wasn't right. I had already legally transitioned by the time the the last festival happened. But I, you know, it's it's something that uh, those kinds of experiences really do um, give you pause to think about what the impact is. And especially when we're talking about gender nonconforming and, and trans folk and how that gets into the mix. And, you know, I've lived it. Um, I've also lived it in the corporate level. I was an executive at a large corporation and we were in the midst of working on their human resources policies. And they brought me in because I was, I was uh, transitioning openly at, the, at that point in time. And because of my legal background, and the sticking point that we got to is that, you know, okay, we can support our, our, our employees that are transitioning from male to female or from female to male, but we cannot in any way condone or, or in, you know, basically allow a policy that's inclusive of somebody coming to work one day as one thing and one day as the next or appearing as neither because that's just not business appropriate. And so um, dealing with that and taking that news back to the LGBT uh, community of, of employees and hearing the divisive conversations even within that community saying, let's take our wins where we have them now, we'll fight the gender non-conforming fight in a future day um, is, is tough. But those are the kinds of, of, of worldly concerns that happen when we're discussing this. And you know, to, to your point, and and other, others that the panelists have raised, it's much easier for a system to say, or an organization, this is too complicated for us to manage, so let's not manage it. Let's draw categorical boundaries. Let's draw these black and white boundaries, which, which um, actually it wouldn't be appropriate to use, use that term, but let's draw categorical boundaries because we don't want to have to face it, rather than be willing to dig into the complexity of the issue. And I think to Terry's earlier point, and Laura's as well, is it's, um, it's about that individual emotional, socio-emotional development. And that's what we really need to always be keeping top of mind. I wanted to come back to something that Laura, you had said, because you talked about having those sensitivities where people are in their own journeys, and, and, and Terry had echoed this too, that we're all, that everyone's in their own journey and it's a process and there's no end point. Um, and one question I have as an organizational leader, and I think perhaps it's now time to turn this panel a little more specific to, to what fielding can do, you know, what should be our role and what can we do both within our organization and as scholar practitioners out in the world, what should we be advocating for? I'm always struck by the tension, and sometimes it's a healthy, good tension, sometimes it's not, but the tension for an organizational leader to, to know that you may have other leaders who are grappling about it and maybe kind of lagging behind some of the others and some of the thinking, and how do you bring them up quickly? Because I guess the other thing is I don't want to be that patient. I think that sometimes, you know, I'm reminded of Martin Luther King who was who was always really irritated by the people that kept saying, yes, we can have civil rights, but not now. We have to do it in our own pace, in our own way, that he was really able to help he and other leaders infuse the whole movement with a sense of urgency. And as a leader myself, I feel this is urgent because we're not inclusive, not nearly enough. And we do these, you know, there are microaggressions that occur and there are ways in which we hurt people, you know, in our well-meaning ineptness. And so, if it is well-meaning, not that it always is, but so I'm really curious about how the four of you have, ex have thoughts on this and perspectives and how you've also personally experienced some of the challenges and tensions that I've just alluded to. So who would like to start? Laura, you are unmuted. Shall I just start with you? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think that's such an important question. And I think a lot of times, one of the issues I see within both the LGBT and just kind of progressive communities in general is that we love to preach to the choir, right? We love audiences that are going to be like, yes, you know, open my mind, engage me. I'm, I'm ready to learn. Uh, that's a lot more fun. Uh, and in some ways can feel more rewarding, but really the challenge is how do we not um, create barriers, uh, but instead call in, the people who really aren't there yet. 
Um, and I think as leaders in whatever area, you know, we have that kind of positioning, that that's one of our great challenges. Um, and, you know, I've, I've, I've done some writing on this in particular in the classroom, uh, whether it's working with, again, um, teachers, administrators, but also fellow students who, you know, are, are saying this, this goes against my belief system. And what it really comes down to, I believe, is um, we want safe spaces, but we also want brave spaces. We want spaces where we can be uncomfortable and we can have really tough conversations, um, you know, and not, and not shy away from them. And I think that's where the most transformation occurs uh, is, is when we are saying, you know, honestly, I find this really weird or, you know, I grew up hearing this was sinful or, you know, it just doesn't connect with me at all and saying, thank you. Thank you. And we want to not call you out, but call you in and engage you in dialogue around this. Um, and in that, as somebody else mentioned, you know, it's a journey. So allowing people to walk on that journey and yes, saying, you know, we need, we need to make changes now, but we're also going to be in this for the long haul. Um, the one note I would put on that though, is to make sure that the people who are walking those, um, those individuals along that journey, uh, want that job because there can be a lot of emotional labor put on people just because they're a minority. Uh, and they'll say, oh, you know, you're that gay person or you're the trans person or you're whatever. Uh, can you tell us what we should do? And they did not sign up for that. They're not in a place at that moment, that day, that chapter of their life where they want to, you know, facilitate that conversation. So, so making sure that you're bringing on people who are actually signing up for that and, mm -hmm. and can do that work. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Very thoughtful. Um, Dawson, what are your thoughts? I, I agree. I think that um, there's a lot of sort of just the expectation of, you know, I, I take it on willingly, but uh, there's other, you know, trans people that I've worked with in organizations that are often, you know, sort of called out as the, you know, the representative that they're not willing to be. Um, I think uh, one thing that happened at the uh, a diversity workshop that I went to last weekend that was very powerful is that that promoted those exact kind of difficult conversations is that you know people se selected identities that they most identified with and then the, the able to have in group and out group conversations mm -hmm. so the in group of a particular set of identities had a very sort of internal kind of uh, discussion about their experiences and what what kinds of microaggressions they were experiencing what kind of institutional barriers they face it and the out group just listened they you know not allowed to talk at that point in time and then after a break came back and the out group discussed and the in group listened and it was sort of it was a way to get the difficult discussions going with witnessing at the same time and it was uh there were tears shed i mean it was it was a very moving experience for both and also that was a clinical psychology cluster diversity training and fielding or yes yes and it was run by dr april harris Britt um and uh and uh dr kranzberg Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. And there, yeah, that can be very helpful too because it also uh, invites people for active listening about difference and so it invites people in in a different way and I think it combines with Laura's comment about you know how do you really help how do you set both a supportive frame but also an accountability frame too for organizational leaders and I think that's the that's the tension. Jerry, and, did and you I just go ahead Dustin. Get on to that one piece, the one one of the powerful things that came out was, uh, you know, listening to the fact that uh, the out group, you know, started saying, yeah, I, this is making me feel bad, but also recognizing that they were looking to the other group to comfort them when that wasn't their job to comfort them. Mm -hmm. Ah, right. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. You know, I think that's another piece of, of that of that story. Thank you. Thank you for including that. Um, Jerry. Yeah. Well, I think that Diversity courses within the curriculum are an important tool for really helping uh, advance people's understanding and and development um, in their understanding of these uh, kinds of issues. So, but I think there are certain kinds of properties that need to to be there. Um, you know, Kohlberg talked about the need to have. 
um, essentially a kind of crisis. And I think somebody used that term earlier in order for somebody to really grow from one level to the next. And um, I think we need to structure those, those courses so that um, students who are going through them are placed in unfamiliar um, cultural settings where they have to come in contact with people who are, in this case, LGBT. Um, and interact in a meaningful way um, and debrief that experience um, where they um, really have to, um, we, we really have to structure those courses to deliberately bring people through um, that identity development process that we know exists. We simply don't take the time to do that. So I think, for example, a single course is probably not enough. It's, it needs to be something that takes place over a sustained period of time um, where people over a number of years can really process um, these kinds of experiences um, and really grow. And they're, they're encouraged and facilitated to take personal responsibility for um, for this process and this growth process, because I do think that the higher levels of um, moral and ethical uh, growth require deliberate, intentional effort. Much like Jessica's learning theory about presenting consistent disorienting dilemmas, but then also supporting the person through the process to be able to engage in their own personal transformation. But you can intentionally set that learning environment. And it may be more easily done in a classroom, which is a more bounded experience than let's say being an organizational leader with a broad set of accountabilities. But I think I appreciate the, the points that you've all raised. I think about Fielding's LBGTQ task force and the recommendations. The policy recommendations are relatively easy to implement uh, in terms of um, removing gendered language, uh, recognizing gender on a continuum, you know, being mindful and intentional about the way we survey and offering that kind of uh, flexibility. Uh, those were easier than, say, think, thinking, uh, incorporating certain, uh, certain seminars and thinking and literature into curriculum, right? That's sort of the longer, slower work. And, and there are faculty and students and alumni who are completely engaged in that and understand that, and there are some who really aren't, right? They, they haven't had that experience, they haven't had, have had to think about that. And so then the organization has to say, how can we, first of all, make that very intentional, this is important work to be done and this is what's expected, along with providing the kinds of resources to help people come into those understandings. I want to bring in Terry, because I don't think we've heard from you on this subject yet. So just to build on what you were saying, Katrina, uh, there is um, scholarly work in this space. You know, queer theory has its own body of research. And, uh, you know, I delved into that quite heavily in my own dissertation and, and writings. And, and I think making that a little more prominent in the curriculum could be useful. You know, we, we do make an effort, I think, to uh, certainly talk about diversity and inclusion. Um, but when, you, when it comes to LGBTQ issues, bringing in that literature a little more overtly and uh, systemically could be a, a great thing to do. I think also just on a practical level, you know, making sure every uh, winter and summer session, there's at least one or two workshops that are practically geared to what uh, J Jerry was saying. I agree, you can create an environment where people are uh, experiencing uh, just enough of that disorienting dilemma that Mesero talks about. Um, and then of course the classroom is a safe supportive space to, to really process that and think about uh, how do you take that forward. Um, there was a really great one that um, Margo and Placida did a few years ago when I was in the program around systemic uh, economic issues and, and really classism. And it was quite impactful. It, it, it really uh, blew me away and, and opened my eyes. And it was, it was a longer day though it wasn't just a one hour workshop. You know, you have to set aside significant time to create those structures and environments to really see how the system works and what it feels like to live in that system. 
So it is significant work and, you know, it takes, I think, some uh, serious um, uh, advanced knowledge of these issues and uh, highly skilled facilitators to pull it off. Uh, but I think we should invest in it. For those of you who are attending summer session in Chicago in July, we have cleared the calendar in order to offer uh, some of this work. So there, there, unless people have scheduled things, there's no nothing else officially going on during these um, sessions. And I highly recommend that anyone who's there attend because I think they're going to be highly meaningful and it will be deep work. So the first is on Tuesday, 4 to 8.30 in three segments, but they're really integrated as session one, two, and three about intergroup dialogue with a focus in one part of the session on intergenerational dialogue. So as a way to, to bridge, to really be able to highlight intersectionality, uh, although it's intergenerational, it really is intersectional in a lot of ways. And then on Wednesday from seven to nine, Margo and Pasta are doing something similar again, Terry. So I would invite um, people who are here, if you are attending session, to really show up. I think it's uh, incumbent upon all of us to do so, uh, especially if you're white and straight and a leader at the university, in my mind, because I think we need to really be able to demonstrably show, so I'm now just speaking from my chair, demonstrably show that we are allies. I want to turn now to the webinar chat and, and Starshine, I don't know if you've been keeping track of the questions and comments, but I think I we're trying to gather around for our Q&A in these last 10 minutes. So I have, there's a, a question that is scrolled up a little bit. I want to make sure that you see from Holly Summers. She says, I've questioned the impact of LGBTQ label acronym where it combines sexual orientation and gender. Do panelists have thoughts about whether it further stigmatizes or confuses others who are not self-educated? Good question. I'll, I'd love each one of the panelists to take this question in turn. Thank you, Holly. Uh, Jerry, why don't you begin? You're currently unmuted. Sure. Well, um, you know, I think that uh, at this stage in the development of our understanding of gender and sexual orientation differences, um, it probably is useful to bundle um, uh, these categories together. Um, but uh, it is important to recognize that there are really significant differences um, and that these are three, you know, sex, physical sex, gender, sexual orientation, they're all different developmental lines. People don't um, necessarily, they're all on a continuum and people aren't necessarily at any, at the same point uh, on that continuum throughout their entire lives. Um, but I think at this point it's probably strategic, although there are some settings where um, it's important to, to make that differentiation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can say, uh, just to tee off on that quickly, that when we did training uh, and development for staff on LBGTQ, that um, there was a lot of confusion and conversation about sexual orientation and gender and what's it in with a lot of misunderstanding about what gender is. So it was quite interesting. I think Dawson, would you like to chime in? I think you posted something on chat, but I can't quite read it. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, it, it's interesting. So my, my lived experience is, uh, it was um, you know, transitioning and having been more of a uh, sort of a butch identified lesbian, a lot of questions I got was, well, then why do you need to transition? You know, that was, so that was sort of at the crux of the, you know, matter for me personally, but then working with undergraduate groups um, and working with uh, younger students, a lot of those discussions have evolved around, you know, uh, who I'm attracted to is not who I identify as internally in terms of how I experience my gender and getting people to kind of work with that, um, even at that level, uh, it creates that kind of a, a deeper understanding for people. Thank you, Dawson. And is it accurate for, for me to say, because I'm not a clinical psychologist, that uh, gender, ha, ha, gender non-conforming gender has also been often been considered as gender confusion or gender dysphoria? And wasn't that actually a disorder? And I don't know if that's still considered a disorder or is that, you know, in other words, talk about problematizing, right, a person. I'm just curious well, because I don't have, and Jerry, you may be able to speak well, to this as a psychologist also. 
Well, um, you know, the, the DSM-5, uh, which is the newest diagnostic manual, has dropped gender identity disorder, and mm -hmm. they now have simply gender dysphoria, which only applies if a person has significant discomfort because of gender issues. So it certainly is conceivable that you could have a non-conforming uh, gender expression and the person um, doesn't experience significant um, anxiety or depression or other kinds of you know clinical symptoms as a result. And so I think that's a step forward, although um, you know, clearly there are debates about that. Well, but thank you. I mean, yeah, thank you at least for correcting me that it was gender identity disorder, which has been dropped as a disorder appropriately. So, uh, Laura, we come back to this question about LGBT, how we pose about LGBT, the acronym. Yeah, um, and I, I think uh, Tom posted one of the, uh, I had a column for a while um, for the LGBTQ community on sexual health. And one of the things we talked about is how the acronym has grown and, you know, where does it end? You know, is it going to be a hundred letters long or, you know, should it be shorter or longer? Um, and I think it's a really important conversation. I don't think there's necessarily an answer. I think there's just more dialogue for people within the community to have. Um, one of the things that I think is important is that, yes, people understand that each letter has a very different uh, and unique lived experience and faces different issues of oppression and marginalization. And so, you know, we're not experiencing all the same thing at the same time um, and that we need to support each other in that. Um, I also think of, you know, two-spirited people, intersex people, asexual people, they're all part of the community, of the, the giant, big, rainbow, queer umbrella. Um, but again, it's those are unique experiences. Uh, for me personally, I do think sometimes there are people or identities that are included that maybe take away from what the point is of, of having this community. Um, for example, <clears throat> you know, sometimes people would include ally. And I, I hope that's not a sexual minority or a gender minority. I hope that the majority of people are at least working towards becoming allies. Um, and another example, you know, is, is where people are adding now um, things like demisexual, which is more of, you know, how you interact with the intersection of romance and sexuality. So I think it, it is about being aware that we're talking about marginalization and oppression. Um, and, and, you know, again, bringing that awareness to the forefront. But, uh, you know, there, again, it's not an easy answer, and I think it just continues to be something that we need to talk about and dig deeper in. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. And I'd ask uh, Terry to weigh in. Did you want to make any other comments? Yeah, just briefly, um, I would recommend people take a look at the integral sexuality model I developed and published in Integral Voices on uh, Sex, Gender, and Sexuality that was published by New York City Press. And um, I posted that in the group. And w what I found is that all of these, while they are unique, they also are integrally um, linked to each other. And on a really practical level, I, I often say it's all about gender. And, and I'll give you a reason why I believe that. Um, you know, gay men are not really stig stigmatized by, by whom they love. They're stigmatized because they're violating gender norms. And, and that has always been the case. Um, and when you think about uh, the intersection between gay, cisgendered gay men and transgender people, this is the big connection, that we're all essentially being stigmatized because we're not really abiding by the gender norms in society. So, so this can be a unifying force within the community and why there oftentimes people say, the trans community, what does it have to do with gay men? And I always tell people everything because the trans folks are dealing with the same issues we have always dealt with as gay men. We're just not seeing it, right? It's a blind spot for gay men. So, so anyway, it, it's all about gender at the end of the day. Thank you, Terry. Uh, I think that is an excellent concluding comment. We're just at the hour, but I would like to, since it is a bit provocative, to bring others in. Um, Dawson, do you have a comment to Terry's points raised? So I think it, um, you know, I, th I think it's, it, it points to the, you know, the, 
sort of where we see the boundary lines being drawn is really around, you know, today it's more about what we're calling gender nonconforming. That bubble has expanded, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, within uh, the transgender community, there is especially, you know, in the, in the trans male community, a large group of, of men that continue to live in a, in a stealth existence because they are very much perceived as cisgender and feel that that is the way to escape the stigmatization. Mm -hmm. So to that point, for their experience, it is about gender. However, uh, it wasn't so long ago that the WPATH standards for transitioning, if you were transitioning in a binary fashion, you had to affirmatively state that you were transitioning so that your affectational preference would be heterosexual. So for example, example, if I male and I were stating, and I was stating that I would, you know, I would be attracted to men, I would not be allowed to medically transition. Mm -hmm. Those, those rules haven't, you know, didn't change until fairly, you know, fairly recently. So uh, it is about gender, but it's also about who we're attracted to. I, 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 I did. Interesting. Um, last comments from you, Laura, and then we'll have Jerry wind up the panel. Laura? Um, I just think this was, you know, a great uh, starting point today. And I think that, um, you know, all of these things will probably raise more questions in people's minds than they came with. And I always think that's a very good sign for any kind of facilitation, you know, is that people leave with more things they want to learn about, more questions that they have, um, and that they bring that back to their communities and then also the fielding community. I know that, um, you know, fielding for me was finding my tribe when I was a student a few years ago. And, um, and I think that there, there's so much good work that we've done. And today is just another step in that direction. So thank, thank you. you I appreciate the shout out. It's a beginning too. There's, it's, a, it's a long, long road here. Jerry, would you like to make any concluding comments? Sure. Well, I, again, I really do appreciate this discussion and, um, uh, very definitely a fielding-esque discussion. I really appreciate the depth of the, the points that are made. I do think that um, that gender is a unifying concept across all of these different LGBT categories. At the same time, who you're attracted to is a dynamic that, that can't be overlooked as well. And, um, and the one thing I do want to point out is how much race, well, how much how much um, uh, culture plays a role in gender expression. So I, what, what I've found is that no matter where you go, people express gender. However, they don't express it in the same way. Um, there are similarities that you see across culture, but sometimes there are dramatic differences. And um, so I do think that that's an important consideration is the role of culture in mediating gender expression. The other thing that we didn't really talk much about that I do think is a real factor is um, race and class and how that affects uh, people's perception of their identity as LGBT people. Um, so for example, uh, some of the youth that, that I've come in contact with uh, who were part of the, the ballroom scene or the house scene in New York City and in urban areas um, often don't feel like they're part of the larger, what are seen as largely white uh, middle class um, uh, discussions about uh, sexual orientation and gender, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but they have found an alternate sort of subculture that provides the support that they need. And so I think the resourcefulness of LGBT people in coping and surviving is, is something that needs to be uh, appreciated as well as when we have these discussions. So. Yes, and it certainly seems like we're all, in a sense, pointing to the next topic in this series, which could certainly be that intersection specifically regarding race, gender, sexuality, and, and economic circumstances. Something that's often under overlooked is the, the role that class can play in all of these. Mm -hmm. Well, I would just like to thank uh, all of the panelists. I'm thrilled to see such a good group here and to see the participants here today. I so appreciate it. And most of all, I'd like to acknowledge and thank and 
once again just highlight uh, how proud I am of Fielding that we have the Building Inclusion Collaborative, which is a large network of people um, and in their leadership with the Inclusion Council that has really been at the forefront of making sure that we create these kinds of spaces and that we do it consistently and with intent and in a deep way. So I think, I don't know if Tom is still on the, on the call, but Tom and others, there are others, but I can't see all the participants. But I just wanna thank the Building Inclusive uh, Collaborative and many of our alumni and students and faculty who are all a part of that.